Eating is an unsurpassable pleasure for a hungry squirrel. But it remains alert as it nibbles away. It remains anxious about becoming the prey of another. For a fox, a snake, or any other animal could convert this joyful moment into a tragic end. Its survival, like that of all creatures on this planet, is fleeting and uncertain. Existence for humans is also fleeting. We can now live to a ripe old age, even 100 years, experiencing all manner of joyful and tragic moments. But we fear no other predators. There are none that feed off us except for viruses and other infectious organisms that attack our health. We are the dominant species, with more than 7 billion people exploiting the resources of this planet. We use technology to rule the Earth and dictate the fate of all living things. Our rule has spread across the world like an oil slick, transforming it into a civilization of cement, asphalt and power consumption that is on the brink of collapse. We continue to destroy nature. In fact, we are losing all connection to it. We are unaware of our biological connection. We believe ourselves to be different, superior. We never gaze at the stars or a tree without seeing ourselves, without seeing our reflection in them, without wanting to take center stage. In the eyes of other creatures, we are a dangerous, fearsome species, endowed with enormous powers, such as the power to exterminate them on a whim or through self-interest. No wonder they look at us with fear and suspicion. This reserve protected Namibian cheetah views its keeper as a friend, an exception to the many other humans who hunt it, shoot it, and want to see it dead. Life among humans for a cheetah is not easy. Farmers have been acquiring increasingly more wild territory and turning it into grazing land for their livestock. Their flocks and herds are very tempting prey for all predators, especially for cheetahs, felines that need to eat fresh meat very often because of their unique body structure. This is why cheetahs are viewed as harmful beasts that must be hunted down and exterminated.
Nothing makes them happier than killing, tearing apart, and digesting a fine prey. A lion can devour up to a fifth of its body weight in one meal. Its menu is very diverse and solely depends on the circumstances and its skills as a hunter. Sometimes, chasing down an equally fast or faster prey may lead it to exhaustion. So it would certainly be very happy if it came across an easy prey, such as a cow, and it would opt for it again in the future. A lion may also attack humans. Its behavior is always unpredictable and dangerous, and it finds it hard to discern which prey it should and shouldn't eat. The teeth, claws, and 250 kilo weight of an adult male are unrivaled when it comes to a one-on-one -on -one battle. A lion is always a threat. So man unhesitatingly shoots to kill when faced with one. In the last 80 years, the lion population in Africa has declined from half a million in 1940 to a recent count of approximately 10,000. Over the past hundred years, sport hunting, the fur trade, and the simple pleasure of killing have all been added to their routine hunting by fear. In fact, all wild animals used to be shot, whether it was for trophy hunting, trafficking in fur or teeth, or for food. And all this resulted in a veritable slaughter. Those times of unchecked extermination have now passed, but not completely. The hunting still continues today. Um, but unfortunately, of course, with, with local people, say, in this country, a lot of them are very poor. You know, their, their daily concerns is just feeding their family, feeding themselves. And if a wild animal is considered a threat to their children or a threat to their livelihood, then of course their immediate need is, is for their family and for themselves. So to them, the, the, the fastest land mammal on earth, the cheetah, you know, to them it's just a pest. Um, and it's really up to us to come to, you know, coming from the outside with, with you know, to, 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 to work with them and educate them about, you know, how special these animals are. But you can't just do it coming in and saying, hey, this animal is very exciting and, and beautiful to look at, you must save it, um, and not understand their perspective and how they view their surroundings and, and the animals around them. A fear of predators may sometimes be an excuse for shooting at them. But in fact, humans rarely shoot in self-defense. Instead, they often do so to let off steam because of contempt for animals or because of profit. A rhino is shot at not because it causes fear, but because of the value of its horn, a trophy that has supposedly manly connotations and indemonstrable aphrodisiacal qualities. Poaching has led to the near extinction of one of the most timid and elusive animals in the wild, the black rhinoceros, which has been rescued in extremis by conservationists. Another serious case of overhunting is that of the wild dog, one of the most threatened species with the greatest risk of extinction. They are shot or poisoned mercilessly because many people hate them. Wild dogs are also very vulnerable to infections transmitted by other species, such as farm animals, 
and this has sometimes led to the killing of an entire pack. Vultures are also hunted down by man. These magnificent carrion birds clean the toxins from carcasses exposed to the elements, thereby completing the ecological cycle of wildlife. But more and more, they're being deliberately targeted by poisoning. For example, the vultures that we work on, um, there's a lot of poisonings at the moment and we don't really know the impact of of these mass poisonings. We had some cases where more than 400 vultures were poisoned at a single um, elephant carcass and, and Botswana's got big problems with poisoning. I think uh, well, there's, there's two reasons for poisoning. Some is, is just incidental where they target other animals. I mean, in Zimbabwe there's been a couple of cases where they targeted elephants, they poison the water holes and then the vultures get poisoned incidentally. But there's also some cases where they actually flee poison the um, vultures because they want to prevent us from detecting them. Because a lot of our, our carcass detection is through vultures. When, when the field staff go out, they see the vultures circling somewhere. They go there, they find the carcasses. So the poachers um, often don't want the vultures actually to give them away or the carcasses. So there's, there's an active um, poisoning of vultures at the moment. The needed respect for nature and animals and wildlife, especially in rural areas like this, where you will find a lot of poaching activities, not only for ivory or for the horn of the rhinos, but also for fish, um, birds and smaller antelope species where they catch them with different methods, uh, where the animals struggle when they catch them, where it's a hard, painful death for the animals, even for the plants, where they cut down the trees, um, we do have a lot of different alien species of trees up in this region which can be used for firewood and for building but the people are not educated 
about which is alien species, which is um, endanger, endangered species up in those areas. So, yes, there is a big problem. Many people believe that animals have no intelligence or feelings whatsoever. They believe that alongside the atmosphere, the land and the vegetation, they belong to an ecological framework that is available to mankind, so they can therefore be neglected, mistreated or killed. Some have already given up and argue that the extinction of many species is a normal, inevitable fact, a natural process that has taken place since the beginning of life on the Earth. But in fact, never before has a single species, Homo sapiens, been the cause of a process of extinction of these proportions in such a short period of time at a scale that is a thousand times greater than that experienced in prehistoric times. Man has not used any cataclysmic event to do this, but instead the tools of civilization that he has created and transported to every corner of the world, no matter how far or remote. As the Earth is increasingly being filled with power and communication networks, with walls, buildings, roads, factories, vehicles and pollution, wildlife habitats are being irrevocably and increasingly depleted. Yes, I, I believe the real world will disappear. Um, as humans increase, we'll, we'll start to manage everything we'll have to, unfortunately. I think the, the real world will, will disappear, I think. <laughs> The gradual disappearance of wildlife seems inevitable. Until the turn of the 20th century, the African continent was home to an enormous wealth of endless fauna. But in a few short decades, it witnessed a sharp decline, until being confined to a few parks that are increasingly exposed to contact with civilization, vulnerable to the threat of urban and demographic pressure. One of the most remote parks in Africa can be found in the northeast of Namibia, in a region far removed from sightseeing tours. Kaudum National Park and its inhospitable surrounding area. The park lies in the center of a vast region that extends across 11,000 square kilometers 
in which animals live and move without bars, roads or urban centers to hinder them. These arid plains of sandy soil and thorny vegetation are home to only a few small villages camouflaged by a blanket of lowland bush. The region has been inhabited since ancient times by Bushman families who until now had not practiced agriculture or livestock farming. But they survived generation after generation thanks to foraging and hunting assimilating into an extremely hostile environment for human life. Here too, humans have had to strive to be happy. Oh. え、お、お、お、かんがかじとは、お、お、お、ちこんかこ、うん、たこんかまかうん、かうかん、は、うん、しかうん、あ、かんがんこせてこ、かんがかれんてて、お、かんがてけしんじゃ、てこ、かんじ
Ya está en el coso, ¿cuál es el nombre? No me conozco. This is their world by necessity, a world they share with trees, plants and animals. Tradition states that animals also had souls at the beginning of time. They spoke to and were indistinguishable from humans. But the world's order later separated men and animals, although both had to coexist on the same land forever. The Bushmen still believe that an animal can contain the spirit of a dead person, so they view them in a similar way. They share their daily lives together and talk about them naturally. I know the lions because I also saw the lions in the bush.
Contemplating a vast landscape of sandy ground and dry bushes also touches and stirs us. From up high, the sight of a combination of light, color and distance in a still seemingly lifeless landscape provides a fascinating and invigorating effect. Your eyes lock on the horizon of an endless ocean. Your mind soars over this landscape with boundless freedom. It is here that the primordial spirit of Africa is to be found. Life connected to the purest unknown nature. A spirit that has been defeated by the march of civilization. In 1898, this still virgin region of northeastern Namibia, the Kadum, was proclaimed a wildlife reserve. The terrain is a vast wavy plain of ancient fossil dunes traversed by two rivers that are known as Omiramba in the native tongue. The Noma in the south and the Kaudum in the north. The seasonal rains that occur between October and April feed these two Omiramba to create wetlands, pools and water holes that slowly dry up until the end of the dry season. The permeable terrain allows the water to filter through to shallow subsurface strata so that the riverbeds constantly accumulate water even in extremely hot periods such as those between October and November when temperatures can be infernal. The Kaudum is home to unique flora and fauna in the western limits of this vast Kalahari region. Annual rainfall is scarce, usually less than 500 millimeters on average. But specific underground water drainage feeds a spectacular variety of trees, bushes, grasses, flowers and roots that shelter a multitude of species. Entering into one of the last wildernesses of Africa provokes indescribable sensations. Observing a landscape so devoid of human civilization opens your eyes to an unknown beauty, yet at the same time triggers certain caution and fear. If few people dare to enter during the rainy season, when trails are made impassable by mud, neither do they venture in now at the peak of the dry season, when daytime temperatures soar to 50 degrees and the midday air is thick and scorching. The most noticeable animals are elephants, as they take over almost all the water holes and reservoirs. A great number of elephants gather around these water holes and riverbeds during the dry season. One can count more than 3,000 coming and going during the course of a single day. But there has not always been so many. A few years ago, poaching had decimated their numbers by 80%. A situation that forced governments to take measures against poachers by setting up constant patrols of rangers in all national parks. Currently, especially in the conservancy, uh, the illegal poaching is not so much because they, they did not even stop completely because of the, some of the people mindset they still keeping continuing of, of uh, illegal hunting but currently compared to the past uh, the illegal poaching is not uh, so much because uh, in the community or the conservancy uh, both these two conservancy George Mukoya and Mdua Nyangana they employed the game guards the one that used to go each every day and do the monitoring in the in, in the area where the wildlife is and if they got any illegal poaching, they have to report it to, 
to the Office of the Conservancy. The Office of the Conservancy must report to the MET so that they can come and uh, arrest those people who are doing those illegal poaching or they having a plan that they are normally doing, uh, like joint patrol with the ministry and the conservation game guards, so that they can uh, mitigate that uh, uh, or reduce that illegal poaching. Decisive government and conservationist campaigns to protect them from poaching has led to a recovery in their numbers. As they move to areas where they're not hunted, such as here in the Kaudum, where they are reproducing again at a good rate. Elephant overpopulation in reduced geographical areas, especially in not very dense lowland bush areas such as the Kaudum, has a huge environmental impact. A large 5,000 kilo bull usually consumes 300 kilos of food per day, up to 6% of its body weight. Elephants defoliate and destroy trees and deplete water supplies that are necessary for them and other animals. If the elephant population increases much more, the park will soon suffer an ecological imbalance that must be corrected. They do not suffer greater hardship by periods of extreme drought because the rangers dig additional water holes for them to drink from. Elephants understand the danger of not having enough water and allow the men to work nearby without threatening them or feeling threatened. They wait patiently as the men work without any fear. When the men have finished and allow the water to pass, the elephants approach confidently, appreciating this initiative. Their intelligence is always surprising. In their comings and goings to the water holes, elephants display many traits of their individual behavior and organization in families and herds. Family clans comprise cows related to each other through their calves, forming groups of up to 20 individuals that travel together by following ancestral migratory trails. Decisions about when, how and in what direction to move are taken by the matriarch of the clan. When she is too old or can no longer lead the herd, she is replaced by the next oldest cow. Leadership and experience play a crucial role in their social organization, with behavior that often recalls that of human beings. When you take elephants, if you absorb them, they are very social animals, they are extremely like humans. I've had many sightings where the matriarch, which is the, the cow elephant who's in charge of the entire herd, if she gives them the sign that they must be quiet, you will find many times a baby running around. And I have seen it myself where the matriarch, she picks up a, a branch and she gives the baby a hiding so that he can learn not to do it in the future. Elephants, they do have a lot of emotions, just like humans. They get angry, they get sad, they get very happy, they fell in love with each other. So. I do believe that, yes. I do believe that they are very much like humans. But I actually have a tendency to elephants, strangely enough. Um, I don't know, they're just so big and so quiet and they look at you funny and if you make them angry, they're like a woman, they'll always remember that you did something wrong. Um, <laughs> but I like elephants, they're actually, they're quite cute and they, they're very open about 
how they feel. It's like if you look into an elephant's eye, it feels like, you know, there's some knowledge behind it. It's not like a sheep that has that stupid face. Elephants communicate in a rather complex language of gestures, bellows and sounds. The gestation period of a calf is 22 months, the longest among mammals. And life expectancy is some 90 years. Elephants and humans share much in common. A week ago or so, we found a, a small little baby elephant that died, and the mother was still with it, and she was trying to, to get it up again, and she was kicking it, and, and then I, I, I just, said to my husband, I said, you know what, Ne, I want to cry for this mom's sake. Really, I want to cry for her because, I mean, you feel so sorry. Then you realize, although it's an animal, it doesn't matter. It's, um, it puts you, it, it put, put you, put you in touch with, 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 with the loss that they, that they just, you know, had. and intellectual maturity, and if it can imagine itself after death, as humans do. If so, the question arises whether animals have or believe they have a soul, a spiritual connection to nature and the cosmos. <laughs> Truly, I believe that they have a spirit. Uh, uh, because they can also think, breathe, they can do the same as the human beings do. There is a spiritual connection, but very few people actually know that. 
or realize that. They don't realize um, how animals affect you, actually. I mean, if you have a bad day, what's the first thing your dog does? He comes to you and he wants to cuddle if you have a horrible day. Um, and strangely enough, if your animal is sick, you will be the same. You will kind of check and make sure because you realize instantly something's wrong. You don't realize, you don't know what yet, but you definitely check it out and make sure you can figure out why your pet is upset and it's vice versa. Your pet will do precisely the same. Um, but very few people actually notice that because people are living in boxes. Mm -hmm. I, I, I won't say that they have a spirit or soul. I don't believe that. Um, but otherwise, when it comes to emotions, I would say that they are, they definitely do feel emotions. People might think I'm stupid, but I actually talk to them. Uh, when we, when sometimes when I drive past the elephants and these big bulls, they always turn back on you and they look as if they're going to be aggressive or whatever, and they just stand and watch you. Lots of times I stop and I talk to them, um, saying, hi, big buddy, how are you? I'm not here to hurt you. So there is, to me, uh, is there, there is some other inner relationship with these animals and it's uh, I w if I could comfort them uh, I would actually do that whatever I could but that's how I feel about it if I, if I see them there I talk to them when the car's off I talk to them yeah I think if you if you are of the view or in the belief that you as a human have a soul or a spirit I think then you could see the same for animals because if I look at people as animals I don't I don't see one as having a soul and the other one not. For me, we all don't have one. But if you, if you think of yourself you have one, I think you are just right to also treat your fellow animals as if they have one. Um, from an outside point where, where I don't believe in any souls, I think there's no difference. So if you believe there is a soul, then your elephant fellow or your lion fellow or the smaller animals, you said insects, but I, I even see insects as being the same. Each life is a life. So. Um, treat it as your own.
The most intelligent animals, such as elephants, also experience a great urge for freedom that is very similar to that of humans. They become stressed and depressed when living captive in a confined space and are not able to move around freely. They need free passage along their territorial routes, but countries have raised countless barriers that block and imprison them. As urban development continues to invade all areas of wildlife, the habitat of elephants increasingly diminishes and coexistence becomes both problematic and disagreeable. A sixth sense warns them that their presence annoys humans. So they try to hide, to become invisible, as a bush spirit would in an imaginary tale. In the most remote parts of Africa, hundreds of unknown communities face the difficult adventure of life each morning. Not only bushmen, but also others who migrate from one place to another in search of water, vegetation and fauna from which to feed. Here there is no pride or material goods to embellish a way of life. Everything that belongs to these poor people can be carried in one hand. Their aspirations are very basic. To be healthy, to have shelter and to obtain food. Livestock is everything for them and also hunting, whether it's done legally or not provided that it feeds them or brings them some money.
They also crave the unexpected tips of some traveller purchasing a souvenir, like for example a simple basket. Dreams of a better life in the urban world persist, but the high cost of living in the city forces them to remain in the village where they can take advantage of free wildlife resources. Now, currently, I'm not thinking to go and live in town because I like living in a remote area because here is, there is a little need that you want compared with the town. Everything there is very expensive, but here it's cheaper. You can uh, learn the trees, you can learn the wildlife, you can learn the behavior of the wildlife, and you have to, it's very enjoyable. An amazing expanse of parched vegetation extends from the Kaudum and the region of the great Kavango, Kwando and Zambezi rivers, dotted by small sun-baked villages.
Africa continues to be the star continent when it comes to biodiversity, and also the most promising for the social and economic development of mankind. But Africa has also witnessed countless conflicts. The most recent occurred throughout the 20th century because of its painful colonial era and subsequent bloody wars. People here have also failed to resolve their problems and have embarked on adventures of hatred and violence that leave a tragic trail of destruction. What in the 1980s was an army battalion camp during the war involving Angola, Namibia and South Africa is now an abandoned field of rubble that recalls the fierce fighting and massacres. We humans do not know how to resolve the problems of relating with ourselves or with the world around us. We are so caught up with our network of emotions and conflicts that we never stop to contemplate nature. Every single night before I go to bed, when I take my spotlight and I walk around and I shine on the ground, look for the nocturnal animals, that it makes me extremely happy. Every single night when I wake up during the night and I just listen for about five minutes to the sounds, of the wild outside, that makes me extremely happy. Sometimes, if you just listen to all the sounds around you, if you just go sit down and have um, complete, complete silence, if you look at, um, um, at the stars in the evening, um, sitting around a campfire, just that whole, whole um, dead silence, it's, it's really so much appreciated. I mean, it's, um, you don't find it when you are in a city or in a town or a, um, you just don't find it you do, and you don't have time for one another. So this is really, you really, I think you really get in touch with your inner self and, and just enjoy it. If we look closely enough at nature, we will discover incredible moments and fascinating creatures. The depths of what seems to be a lifeless river can be home to amazing animals that move silently through its currents and occasionally emerge to breathe. Hippopotamus is the closest living mammal related to the cetaceans. It has inhabited the rivers and lakes of Africa for more than 16 million years. But far from being fascinated, man views it as yet another obstacle to be eliminated from the landscape. An untamable beast that jealously guards its watery territory, becoming very aggressive when it's disturbed by a swimmer, a canoe, or a motorboat. With its up to 50 centimeter teeth, its powerful bite is usually deadly. It was just here at the, at the wound on this side of the clinic. It is a hippo, it bited the person just on the middle. It cut him on the middle because he was on the, on the, on the, in the river there are stones 
when the water is down, a little bit down. So Himi was on that stone. So it was coming behind. People respond by killing a few after each attack, and its numbers have declined considerably in recent years, progressively disappearing from many lakes and rivers on the continent. It is a very sad situation for an animal that, although sometimes viewed as a monster, is also capable of arousing much sympathy. My favorite animal at this point, which I hate, is my friendly hippo that keeps on chasing me on the boat. Um, it's only one, and he constantly, but it's not an aggressive approach, really. He just follows the boat everywhere, which is no fun if you're on a small boat and this thing pops up next to your engine constantly. I swear a lot <laughs> if I see him. Um, I'm not, at that point, I am quite scared, but it's, like I said, it's not an aggressive approach per se. He pops up, he makes a noise, and then he goes away and you think he's gone, and then you relax and then he comes again. It's... But nothing has happened so far. He has never made an aggressive movement. He's just been chasing me around the river for a while. <laughs> so it's not bad. It is not easy to live with all manner of animals, some of which are endowed with unpredictably wild instincts. The gradual occupation of rivers by humans has led to a difficult coexistence especially with hippos and crocodiles. Kids, they, they like swim in groups. While they are swimming there, the crocodile also can come and catch one. When a crocodile attacks a person, a search is usually organized that culminates in an indiscriminate slaughter. The authorities do not permit such searches, but find it difficult to stop them. Teach children, they should understand that Although that some animals are dangerous, as you, are, as you said earlier, like crocodiles in the river, you know, this time of uh, the year where Lena, I mean, children are expected to, 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 to go and swim, there are a lot of them uh, in the afternoons, especially after school, we observe them swimming. Even if you tell them that there are crocodiles there in the river, the children, they are, they are not afraid of, 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 of animals in the the dangerous animals in the river. It's just to, maybe they need guidelines. Uh, parents also need to be close there to supervise them. The authorities and schools promote accident prevention and focus on the preservation of wildlife for the tourist trade, but this is not enough. Humans make use of rivers with very little knowledge or preventive measures, and this means that crocodiles and hippos continue to cause problems and are subject to uncontrolled reprisals. It would be effective to create fenced-off natural pools, protected spaces for swimming in rivers, but this has not been done yet. In the meantime, every month there is news of a child devoured by a crocodile or talk of a hippo slaughter 
without any of this causing great concern for the people. Generous rainfall makes this region in the extreme northeast of Namibia an attractive place for the thousands of families making a living from agriculture and livestock, characterized by periodic rises in the Kavango and Zambezi rivers. But all these people also find it very uncomfortable having to suffer the inconveniences of wildlife. Living with wildlife poses some risks that could be avoided by educating people and taking action to deal with them. From malarial infection to the bite of a spider or a snake. Yes, you get a little bit of, I wouldn't say it's dangerous or anything, but it's a nuisance at most. Um, for me, the worst is mosquitoes, they like me for some other reason, so they really bite me a lot. And then you've got the added danger, there's a possibility of malaria, but in the five years that I've been here, it hasn't happened. Um, because malaria is um, something that needs to be transferred from one person via mosquito to you. So it's not easily gonna happen, but there's a, there is a risk. The spiders, you learn to live with them, they, they're part of the ecosystem, so um, yeah, they, the spider webs and so on, that's a bit, makes it something look nasty and dirty, but you just keep on top of it, clean it, and most of the nuisance spiders, they move away. And then you've got some of the big ones, which are not building webs and so on, and they can be a bit scary, but they're nice. And then we've got some snakes around. I love snakes, so I normally catch the snakes. <laughs> They, um, other people are scared of them, obviously, and they run away. Raw direct contact with the wild can sometimes lead to uncontrollable panic. But nature deserves no exaggerated fear, only knowledge and respect. Um, I think it's always good to keep a little bit of a distance because um, respect to each other. I also <laughs> keep distance to other people, so I think. But fear, no, I don't think it's necessary to be f scared of wildlife. Maybe more respect. People form distorted views of the wild through an ignorance of the natural world and a fear of the creatures inhabiting it.
If fear causes animals to be criminalized, excessive overprotection leads to idealization. For one reason or another, people form very confusing, mistaken views of the reality of wildlife. Yeah, I think the, and it, it's getting stronger. I think the misconception towards wildlife and ecology grows as, as people get more and more removed from, from the wild and wildlife. I think more and more people live in big cities and don't really get into contact with wildlife and the, the whole concept of, of wildlife, wild animals, conservation, ecology is just coming more and more um, obscure and, and removed from the reality. Um, I think a few Walt Disney films influence that also and give animals certain characteristics and, and that stays with people and they, they think that's the way it is. Um, I think that nature and the wildlife is very, very different to, to what we think. The only way to understand the cycle of nature and wildlife is to respect it to be in direct contact with it without any misconceptions, without any veils or technology coming in between. A very difficult goal to achieve when people are constantly distracted by communication technologies. I surely believe that people need to get back to nature. Uh, technology has made people so impersonal and they are getting addicted to that and being out here in the bush is the uh, only place where you really can shut down from the outside world, get closer to your inner self and actually see what's going on in nature. For me just being out in the bush in the nature is it just brings peace. Whereas when you're in town there's, there's never this peace that you get. When you're out in danger, it's just, it's just nice. You, you feel yourself, if I can put it that way. That's, you're just part of it.
disappearing forever. Yeah, for example, when our people um, are so hungry and they will try many days for killing any animal and they found lion killed something, they will have to talk to lion, chase them away and then get the meat from the lion. So they say that the lion will share, always share. They not kill the human being, but uh, um, the only way is <coughs> to talk to a lion. You should say, for example, So that means, give me some, um, some of the meat, so I can have. But do you believe the lion can understand this language? Can understand you? Yeah, they will. They will move. All of them move out and then the person can come and get meat. A leopard's gaze is always enigmatic. It fears for the future. Its eyes are fixed on us. If its spirit was similar to ours, it would ask us how far we're capable of going to alter the harmonious cycle of nature. Nature gives meaning to our lives. Our origins lie in the land, the minerals, the water, the air, the molecules and the atoms. Humanity needs to remember that it is part of nature, that it cannot continue to destroy it. Living in harmony with nature would lead to a new world, a more balanced and respectful world, significantly different from the one we're building now. If we fail, this vast spectacular territory of Africa could truly become forever the last wild. <laughs>